First, before we begin with the seminar, and that is, as you all know, and as I said in the message sent a day or two ago, this Friday is our big day. This is coming 100 years in the making. So screen building for 100 years is this Friday. So we really are going to have a great time and a wonderful occasion. Many, many alumni are coming. Looks like around 180 out of town alumni will be here, and then some alumni are here as well. So somewhere in the order of 250 to 300 people will be around here, but 180 people coming from outside for school alumni. So really would like all of you to participate. Uh, uh, great. And, uh, let's have a great time on Friday. Thank you. And if you normally have a class on Friday afternoon, you do not this Friday. They're canceled. <laughs> okay, I am pleased to introduce our speaker today. It is not too often that we have people who graduated 28 years ago, and we all remember Jennifer. And she was also a faculty member in chemical engineering at Purdue. We have a photograph of her from 1997 in the one of the centennial books, and she looks the same. And my response to that is, it's unfair, because nobody else looks the same. But she hasn't aged that much, or I should say very gently. Thank you. And Jennifer was also the head of the Department of Freshman Engineering when she was here, and was an associate dean for undergraduate. And that's the position that Mike Harris has at this time. After Purdue, she went to the University of Florida in Gainesville, where she was department head and now is a distinguished <coughs> professor there. She is interested in particulate flow, and she's received a number of outstanding teaching and research awards from different organizations like Purdue. And she's going to speak to us today about particle laden flows, applications, modeling approaches, and challenges. And this is one of our centennial lectures, so it is being filmed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Arvin. Appreciate it very much. I, I was saying, I think to Ramke, that the last time I gave a lecture here, I think it was my interview <laughs> in 1996 or 1997. So it's wonderful to be here again. Um, as Phil mentioned, I'm going to be talking about particle laden flows, and this may not be an area that many of you are working in. So I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction to the area and then give some specific uh, research problems that we've been working on. And one of those problems I'll get into a little bit uh, in more detail. So particle laden flows. Um, first, I want to start out with a little bit of plug for education in particle technology. Uh, these particle uh, processes, um, processes of our particulates are throughout many, many industries. And these include the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry, pharmaceutical, plastics, food processing. There, I mean, there's huge number, energy, environmental. Um, this pharmaceutical, the Purdue is, is involved in a engineering research center in uh, with Rutgers University in pharmaceutical processing applications, many of which involve particulates, um, metals and metals powders, um, I think mining is on this list. I just came back from a sabbatical in Australia and mining applications. There are a lot of particle technology research in Australia um, with a lot of applications to the mining area. Uh, space applications, I'll discuss um, one project we're working on with NASA that have to, has to do with particulates and even biomedical applications. We work on a project right now to simulate how particles flow through the airways because um, uh, pulmonary drug delivery, uh, particles um, that are um, uh, that are in, in um, 
uh, breathed in through the airway, uh, breathed in and then they move through the airways. The lung has a high absorption site, so uh, it's a great absorption site for drugs and how particles move through the airways and where they, their final fate, where they deposit is uh, very important for that dr drug delivery mechanism. And we do CFD, computational fluid dynamic simulations of particle movement through the airway. So, this these particle technology has a wide range of applications, and in fact, I've worked in this area my whole career, and I think the reason I've been able to sustain working in this area throughout my career is because the tools that I use, the modeling tools that I use, and the experimental tools that I use, the application area has changed throughout my career, but there are so many applications, there's so many new problems and challenges that it's been an area I've been able to sustain throughout um, a 25 year career because um, the applications and the problems are so large. However, all of that said, more than 50 and more than 50% of products in the chemical industry are either solid or have a solid um, in one phase of their production. All of that, there's still very little particles technology education in the curriculum of a typical chemical engineering program. So uh, when I was here at Purdue, we started this particle, te particle technology course, and uh, Mike Harris and now Jim Litzer are teaching this course. It's a very valuable um, uh, area, and many of you will be working in areas w uh, involving particulates when you graduate, but uh, the education is still woefully uh, lacking in this area. So um, uh, this is an area that more education is definitely needed. And as I said, the applications are very varied. The one application I want to talk about um, briefly is this space application. We have a program with NASA, and you might say, well, why, how are particles involved in space? Well, when spacecrafts take off and land from lunar or Martian surfaces, these are very high-speed jets, and they impact um, the soil layer, and these particles are kicked up. This is a very is a low-gravity, low-pressure environment. These these particles are picked up and cratered at very, um, at very high rates of, of flow, and they can basically sandblast anything in the neighboring vicinity. So how these particles crater, which actually affect the stability of um, the landing of this vehicle, and the trajectory and where their final fate is going to be is very important, understanding those phenomena. So we simulate how, right now we're working on simulating high speed jets impacting particle beds. And um, my students do a lot of experiments with NASA of, of high-speed jets impacting particle beds, and I'll uh, discuss that a little bit. We even flew in the uh, zero gravity. Last year we, we were one of the 19 groups that were chosen by NASA to fly in the zero gravity aircraft flight uh, to conduct some particle, some particle research, these cratering experiments at low gravity and two times Earth gravity. And these kind of particle processes are definitely in the mainline chemical industry, reaction and, and fluidized beds and risers and transport, pneumatic conveying and slurry conveying of particles. And all of these applications that I talked about uh, benefit from understanding of their flow behavior. And, and the key things typically we want to stand is the mixing of the solids, the segregation, how particles deposit, how they may attrit, and all of those are influenced influenced by the size, the size distribution of the particles, how high they're concentrated and their shape. And these are effects that we concentrate on and how they influence the flow behavior in a variety of applications. So that kind of summarizes um, uh, the broad area of my research. First of all, I want to leave you with the impression that particles definitely behave differently than liquids. So studying liquid behavior does not necessarily translate to what you would see in a particle flow. For instance, a uh, static liquid has a zero shear stress where a static bed of particles um, has a finite shear stress. So that allows particles to form a heat. And also, if you look at how particles versus liquids are stored, if you look at liquid storage systems, they're usually short and squatty because um, the stress distribution in a liquid increases with increasing depth below the surface, whereas in a solid, that stress asymptotes as you move 
um, lower into the bed of solids, and that's because some of the solid stresses are uh, supported by the walls of the confining vessel. So that's why you see silos for storing solids, and you see these uh, short squatty vessels for storing, storing liquids. Other things are, for example, and these are just a few examples of why when you learn about liquids, you cannot necessarily translate that to flow behavior. If you look at the discharge rate from a liquid tank, you know that's gonna decrease as the head decreases, but in a, in a um, hopper, which is uh, typically a conical shaped vessel that stores particles, as the, lick, as the solid uh, level decreases, that has no effect on the discharge rate. Maybe just at the very end of the discharge, you'll see some uh, kind of change in the uh, flow rate. But pretty much throughout the whole discharge, the, solid, the whole uh, decreasing of the, of the head of solids, the discharge rate is constant. Also, mixing. Um, typically, I mean, if you don't have immiscible liquids, the more mixing uh, uh, of two liquids, uh, the more homogeneous product that you achieve. But that's not necessarily true with solids. So um, you can even get the possibility of demixing when you mix two solids, and that demixing could even increase with increased mixing time. So more mixing might not produce a more homogeneous mixture. So these are just some anomalous behaviors that you would see with solids that you do not see with liquids. So uh, the message is that knowledge that you learn is li with liquids do not necessarily translate to solid behavior. And so I want to talk about uh, two, a lot of our work has to do with modeling these particulate flows. So I want to talk about two basic approaches to modeling uh, particle-laden flows. And these are either dry particle flows. By dry, I mean particle flows only where you neglect the, the effect of the interstitial fluid or um, fluid solid flows. That could be gas solid or liquid solid. One approach is to treat the solid phase as a continuum, and we call these models two-fluid models. So you basically write equation, uh, equations of motion that describe the solid phase that look much like um, a Navier-Stokes-like equation for the liquid. The only difference is that when you, you come to the part where you have to describe the constitutive, uh, the stress in the solid phase, the constitutive relation that you use is not Newton's law of viscosity, it's a new constitutive relation where you have to describe how the effective stress of the particle phase changes with its solids concentration, its size, its volume fraction, etc. And the state of the art for that, if you have particles that are dominated by inertia, and by that I mean particles that whose motion, their details of their motion is really dictated more by collisions between particles and collisions with the confining vessel rather than they're just merely tracing the fluid phase, um, the state of the art for that is to use uh, a kinetic theory type of approach. So the idea is that we describe particle motion analogous to molecules in a dense in a dense gas, and but molecules in dense gas collide elastically, and we say that these particles collide inelastically. So we define a coefficient of restitution, that's E, that describes the effective stress. So the, for instance, the viscosity of the particle phase would be a function of phi, the volume fraction, the concentration of the solids, the density of the particle phase, D, the size, the E, that's coefficient of restitution of particle collisions with each other, and um, uh, the shear rate. And this theory has been well worked out uh, for spherical monodispersed particles. So uh, we have a constituent relation based on kinetic theory, but what happens if these particles are not spheral, for, spherical or monodispersed? And a lot of our work has to do with that. But the beauty of this approach, this continuum-based approach, is that we write equation of motions that I said look much like the Navier-Stokes equations, and we can simulate very large-scale systems. Um, since we're not simulating individual grains, we can model a large-scale system, we can couple the equation of motion with thermal energy balances or species continuity equations if we want to describe a reactive system. And these are the type of models that you would find in commercial CFD codes, computational fluid dynamics codes, that would describe 
describe a multi-phase fluid particle or, or um, uh, which is gas or liquid solid type of system. Um, that's the benefit of this kind of approach. But uh, right now, most of these theories are um, uh, constrained by the spherical monodispersed assumption. And these kind of models have been used to describe the pneumatic conveying of solid. These are some of the applications we've worked in, worked on in throughout my career. Fluidized beds um, describes flow uh, of particles in inhalers that could be used for pulmonary drug delivery, could describe flow of particles in spray dryers, and as I mentioned before, they can incorporate heat transfer or reactions. So this is just an example of a simulation of fluidized bed. I mean, you can describe the bubbles, how the bubbles shape um, and size uh, changes with bed height. Uh, you can describe the uh, bed expansion, the bubble rise velocity. You can get a lot of stati statistics about the hydrodynamics of these systems. You can scale up these systems. You can see how the scale up and the hydrodynamics of these systems affect the uh, conversion in reactive systems. The other approach is to describe the, mo the motion of individual grains. So this would be called a Lagrangian or a discrete element method. And a lot of my work in this area, I collaborate with uh, a professor at Purdue, Professor Wasgren in mechanical engineering, who is an expert in this discrete element method simulation. So in these simulations, um, we describe the motion of individual grains of particles. And uh, so we write basically F equals MA type equations for every individual particle. And the forces that act on the particle would be contact forces, any forces uh, due to the influence of the interstitial fluid, gravitational forces, you could add electrostatic forces, you could add viscous forces if you have a liquid layer surrounding the particles that would form liquid bridges between particles. So uh, the model is as good as the forces that you put in into uh, these interactions between individual grains. In the other approach, the models are as good as the constitutive relations we use to describe the effective stress in the particle phase. And as I said, in this type of model, the particles are treated as discrete entities. So we can easily, for each individual particle, label each individual particle with a different size, a different density, um, and I'll show later a different shape. That's very easily. But the constraint on this kind of system is the number of particles. Um, so the type of models that we would use, if this is just a contact-based system, particle collisions, is you could use a soft particle collision model. That just means that we allow for some particle deformation. And the normal force and the tangential force, the normal force is related to the degree of overlap um, uh, delta. And KL and KU are the uh, loading and unloading spring co constants for that normal interaction. And then you could have some kind of columbic type interaction for the tangential forces described um, uh, those type of interactions. So if you know the coefficient of restitution for the particle-particle interaction and the coefficient of friction for particle-particle or particle-wall interactions, you supply that into the discrete element code, you can do a complete simulation of these fluid particle in the case where contacts are your dominant uh, interaction mode. But as I mentioned, the key constraint here is the number of particles that you can treat. So if you have a dry system, uh, and that's systems in which you neglect the fluid interactions, uh, we're saying that the fluid really doesn't have a significant behavior in the particles, you're typically now talking about 10 to the 6, maybe 10 to the 7th particles that you could simulate. Uh, in a realistic time frame. And uh, if you're talking about a wet system where you include the, how the dr liquid affects the drag on the particles, maybe 10 to the fifth number of particles. But if you're talking about a real system where you have an, some real a industrial application or real geophysical process, you might have greater, often greater than 10 to the ninth particles. So one might say, well, why is this method useful? Well, this method is useful for several reasons. One, you can get some insight into the details of the flow structure. So perhaps you can just simulate a small system, and that would be indicative of the large-scale behavior. And that's definitely true if in that small system you're not missing any large-scale collective effect by just simulating the small system. The other uh, key thing is that you can validate 
um, particle phase constitutive relations that have been developed for Eulerian models. Um, and I'll, I'll show a little bit of an example about that. Or you can even use these simulations to develop new constitutive models that you can then input into an Eulerian type CFD code. So there is a linkage between these discrete element method and a continuum based approach. And uh, that linkage I'll be talking about in, in this um, seminar. So some, I'll just give a few examples of some of the pro problems that we've been working on in the last couple years. We work on um, particle segregation. So when you form a drug tablet, you're often mixing active ingredients and inactive ingredients. You're mixing those in a blender. So if we assume um, those particles are mixed well, and that's a big assumption, but let's assume that they're mixed well, and then we place those particles in a hopper, a, a storage device that holds particles, and then we discharge that hopper into a tabletter, and that's what we see here. We're filling a little die, and then we have a tablet press that um, punch, uh, applies a compressive form, form on a, um, the die, particles in the die, and forms a tablet. When those particles are exiting that hopper, there is no guarantee, if even if they were charged uniformly in that hopper, that they're going to discharge with a uniform concentration. So if we were to measure the concentration of the particles coming out of that hopper, there's no guarantee that that's going to equal the concentration um, of its initial charge. In fact, that's what we see in these simulations. So we're able to do experiments and um, simulations and experiments. So we, we charge a hopper uniformly, and then we let th these particles come out of the hopper with some known concentration. The red particles are, for instance, small particles. The blue particles are large particles. And we have these fine particles at some concentration. We let those discharge and measure the concentration of these fine particles at the, dis at the exit. And we plot that concentration of the fines. These are are normalized fine. So one indicates that the concentration of the smaller particle coming out of the exit is what we initially charged the hopper with. And then we let that discharge, and this is the fractional discharge, and what we see is that initially, yes, the particles come out with the, with the concentration that they, the fines uh, the particles discharge has the same concentration of the fines that it did in the initial charge. But then as we move through the discharge, then for a while we have a decreased concentration of fines. That means we have a greater concentration of the larger particles. And then at the end, we have a very high concentration of the fines. So all of this material would clearly be off spec if these particles were filling an individual dye. So we'd have too much, for example, of an active ingredient in that specific drug drug tablet, and pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money to ensure uniformly, uniformly of these drug tablets and the active ingredient concentration. So this is a simulation, hopefully this will work. Okay, by, um, in fact, this is one of um, uh, my last Purdue student, uh, Bill Ketterkating, and did some simulations. He did a lot of work in hopper uh, discharge. So this is a simulation of uh, particles discharging from a hopper, and the red particles are uh, the fines, and the blue are the coarse. Again, these uh, color bands were just to indicate um, uh, just different regions of the flow, so you could see how the flow, the flow structure in the hopper. And basically, as we discharge particles from this hopper, up until a um, little past 80% of the discharge, there's no problem. We have a fairly uniform discharge of con in terms of concentration. And then at the very end, we get a decreased concentration of the fines and then an increase. And the reason we have that is because these fines, the red, percolate through this bed. And, um, and the coarse are more concentrated here. And in fact, that concentration, the coarse at the top, increases with shearing on the, on the free surface. So when we continue this discharge, we get increased concentration of the course, and at the very end, the fines come through. And now, this segregation behavior can definitely be altered by changing the angle of this hopper, by changing the concentration of fines here, by changing the ratio of the sizes of the two particles, by changing the friction of the particles with the wall. There's many factors that affect that, and that was the subject um, of his thesis. The follow-on thesis to that, uh, Anshu, uh, 
Anad, who worked with me at Florida, uh, who just finished, he looked at now we know in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, we operate this hopper in Indiana, we operate this hopper in Arizona. The behavior is completely different. Why is that? The reason is because we have more humid environment in Indiana versus Arizona. So these particles are coated with a little liquid layer in Indiana where you don't see that liquid layer in Arizona. So the flow behavior and the segregation behavior of those particles coming out of the hopper can be completely different in those two environments. So what Anshu looked at was the effect of liquid moisture on the surface of the particles. And we characterize that effect by the bond number. The bond number um, is the ratio of the cohesive forces to the gravitational forces. So the more, the st higher the strength of this liquid layer, the more cohesive forces. The, um, the larger the particle, the greater inertia of the particle, the greater the gravitational force. So we have some simulations here looking at various bond numbers. A bond number of zero is a cohesionless system. So these particle discharge looks much like the simulations that you just saw in these flat bottom hopper. And then we slowly are going to increase the cohesivity, that is, we're increasing the liquid layer around the particle, or you could increase the surface tension of the liquid surrounding the particle, any of those effects. So we have a little, a small layer of cohesion. You can see the particle starting to uh, stick to the size of the hopper. And the angle of repose, that means the angle that the particles, uh, of the particles that remain in the hopper in this flat bottom hopper um, is greater with more cohesion. As we continue to increase the cohesion, you see these clumps of particles start to come out of the hopper, a lot of adhesion. And at a certain point, I mean, we didn't continue this simulation, we just got, we have clumps of particles coming out. And if we increase this cohesion just a little bit more, add a little bit more moisture, this hopper would be completely completely blocked, okay? And that's why you see in practice den um, dents on hoppers in industry, because people are banging these hoppers trying to get this material out, because they've got hoppers poorly that are poorly designed, they have got a very cohesive system, they either don't have a large enough orifice, they've designed the angle incorrectly of the hopper, uh, various reason for that system that they're dealing with, the particulate system that they're dealing with. And there are rational design tools available to design these. Um, but most, mostly, going back to my first slide, there's a lack of knowledge of what those design tools are. People in industry just design a 45 degree hopper and assume everything's going to come out. Okay, so I talked about two methods of describing particulate flow, this discrete element and this continuum based. Well, there is a relationship between these two. Um, this is a plot of the shear stress, the normal one component of the shear stress versus the solids volume fraction. And this is a system where we're, we're, we have 3D shearing, um, just be um, a 3D shear box. This is a periodic shear box, and we're applying a shear um, to that system. We're applying a shear to that system for a given solid volume fraction, a given coefficient restitution, in this case 0.95. We're letting the system come to steady state or equilibrium, and we're measuring the effect of stress or the effect of viscosity in that system. And the squares indicate the results of the discrete simulations. The line indicates a kinetic theory based on this dense gas idea. And you can see there's very good agreement, except that the very high solid volume fraction, that has to, that goes into the assumptions inherent in, in kinetic theory, whether um, they assume that the particles, the particles are not Maxwellian dis distributed, but what kind of perturbation away from Maxwellian is assumed. And so typically at these high solid volume fraction, you get some disagreement. But for reason, fairly inelastic, um, uh, particles, just slightly inelastic particles, the agreement is pretty good. But again, the assumption here is spherical monodispersed particles. So 
a lot of our work recently is what happens if the particles aren't spherical or if the particles aren't monospersed, then what do we do? What kind of modeling um, are we going to use in a continuum-based simulation? Well, for example, these kind of discrete element simulations can test or evaluate various kinetic theories that have been proposed, typically in the physics community, for how the stress varies with um, for even in, in the case of a bimodal system, the size difference between the two particles and the concentration of each particle phase. So in the case of bimodal particles, for instance, many kinetic theories have been proposed. Some of them rely on a Maxwelling velocity distribution, so they assume each particle phase, the velocity fluctuations are distributed Maxwellian, or they may assume that the particles have an equal partition of energy. So each particle phase has the same amount of effective kinetic energy associated with the velocity fluctuations. Well, which assumptions are appropriate? There's many kinetic theories out there. Well, this discrete element method can provide the answers. So um, we basically take two different particle size, put them in the same shear box, Shear, those, shear that system, allow the system to come to steady state, measure the stress, and see how that varies with size, ratio, concentration of the two phases, etc. Now, in this case, these simulations were performed by a former student of mine, uh, Christine Herenia. This is when I was a faculty member at um, Carnegie Mellon. Christine is a, a faculty member at University of Colorado now. So she tested the various theories and plotted the stress versus the size ratio of the large particle to small particle for a given coefficient of restitution, a given concentration, this is a volume fraction of the large, the volume fraction of the small, and a given total concentration. This is just one one example, and she found clearly that one set of assumptions, the set of assumptions that assumes the particle velocity distribution was non-Maxwellian, was clearly the right one. Any, any theories that just try to describe the effective particle stress of a bimodal system, which assume a Maxwellian distribution, are not going to predict the stresses correctly. And she was able to come to that conclusion from these discrete element simulations. And it didn't really matter whether there was an assumption about the equipartition energy or not. So the Maxwellian uh, assumption was the, or non-Maxwellian was the key one. So we then, based on her results, then used the correct kinetic theory and then were able to simulate fluidized beds, that same fluidized bed that I showed you earlier. Now that fluidized bed was with a monodispersed spherical particles, very simple mixture. Um, we then can now simulate a fluidized bed with two particle sizes. So we have the same density of particles, two different sizes, and we use this corrected kinetic theory. We then, uh, through a, a postdoc that I was working with, we then um, input that whole code into CFX, which is one of those commercial CFD um, codes, and we're able to simulate a fluidized bed with two different sizes of particles. So some of the results we found, for example, is that when you have a monodispersed mixture with the same solder mean diameter as a bimodal mixture, the bimodal mixture always has a lower minimum fluidization velocity, and this is known in practice. And if we were to look at the H, which is the bed expansion, as a function of the fluidization velocity, the bed expansion is much greater with the bimodal than the monodispersed. So these are some key features about fluidized beds that we can predict and scale up because we now can describe a bimodal mixture of particles. Other things like there's some uh, phenomena of layer inversion that has been reported in the literature. For instance, if you have a mixture of small, heavy particles and larger light particles, it's shown that the concentration of the small particles is higher when you're at, that's these red lines, when you're at a lower fluidization velocity, this is the concentration versus the bed height. So we have a concentration, higher concentration of the small particles um, 
at the top of the bed at a lower fluidization velocity, the other, the larger particles at more at the bottom, but then as you increase the fluidization velocity, that segregation pattern can reverse. And it's basically a competition between drag, um, the particle phase stress, and the gravitational effects on the particles that, that can predict this layer inversion. But if we don't have an accurate stress model for the particle phase, you would never even, never be able to predict this layer inversion. So the, the rest of the talk, I'm going to concentrate on this effect of particle shape. So we've been working on describing um, the case where you have um, a non-spherical particle. And every time I would give a talk um, before we start dealing with non-spherical particles, if there was someone in industry, they would always say, we don't deal with, non we don't deal with spherical particles in industry. What happens if the particles are non-spherical? What if they're elongated? What if the, what if they're rough. So we've been working to address this. And, but however, most of the models that you would find in commercial codes, uh, very detailed models, always, almost always make the assumption of spherical particles. And even detailed experiments that probe the nature of particle-particle interactions in a fluid typically assume um, idealized spherical grains. So what if the particles aren't spherical? Well, there's a lot of effects. We have different effects on the drag, which I won't talk about the heat today. Um, if you have a highly turbulent flow uh, for conveying situations, you can get a different effect on the modulation of turbulence. So particles interact with the fluid at the level of the fluctuating velocity different. Um, depending on their size, their shape, and their concentration. At, um, I'll just mention this briefly. At Florida, we've been, one of my students has been working on this area. Um, basically, we try to look at the effect of modulation based on the Stokes number of the particles. Stokes number is the solid response time to the fluid response time. So particles that are very large, have hard, large inertia, have a large Stokes number. And in one limit, for very low Stokes numbers, um, this dotted line is the detailed motion of the fluid, if we have a very low Stokes number, the particles are just going to be following along the fluid motion. So they may affect some the drag on the fluid, so the fluctuation of the fluid may diminish some due to the effect of the particles. And at the opposite end, you have particles that have such large inertia that if the fluid, this is the detailed motion of the fluid, the particles are just moving right through the fluid. So they're basically unaffected by the fluid. However, if they're very massive, with very large Stokes number, they can actually stimulate, increase, or modulate the fluctuations in the fluid phase. So you can get a whole spectrum of behavior. So at Florida, we have this uh, particle uh, research center, which has a large high bay area. So we built this a very large scale uh, slurry flow loop. It's a continuous flow loop, and it allows for continuous flow of uh, fluid solids through an upflow, a co-current upflow section. This is this line here. It's, it's two stories high. We make measurements at the top of this section using this technique called laser Doppler velocimetry, which allows us to measure the fluid and the particle fluctuations simultaneously. So we can measure what's going on with the detailed nation um, nature of the motion of the fluid and the particles. And then we capture these um, uh, the, the suspension and then the solids flow downward in a standpipe. We have an overflow that captures the fluid in this settling tank, the storage tank, and then the fluid moves through the particles through this pump, re-entrains the particles, and moves through this co-current upflow line. So it's a very detailed um, way to measure this, uh, these, these motion of the particles. It's a continuous setup. It's very flexible because we can change the flow rate, the particle sizes, the concentration, and in, we can even measure dense phase flow using an index of refraction ma matching technique, which is what we're doing currently. And we've, some of the results we found that is that when the Stokes numbers are very small, 
as I mentioned, these particles and the fluid are very close in terms of even their mean motion. You may get some modulation of the fluid, but very little. Um, and then in the intermediate, intermediate uh, flow of Stokes numbers, 5 to 30, you start you still have very small uh, relative velocity between the phases, but you can even have fluctu solid fluctuations that exceed the fluid. And then at the highest Stokes number, you start to get a separation at the level of the mean velocity, and you can even have solid velocity fluctuations that are lower than the fluid because they're stimulating the motion, the fluctuations, and the liquid. And this refractive index technique that we're using right now, the system that we're starting with is um, a sodium iodide system. Um, we mix sodium iodide with water. This is with silica gel particles. We found that the Pyrex um, glass beads were better, but basically uh, you can make a system of liquid and solids basically invisible. Right now the laser Doppler technique is limited by the concentration of particles. So you're shining this laser through the system and if you have too many particles you get too much scattering and you don't get a clean signal but if you make the system invisible the laser system is just picking up the small mismatches of index of refraction between the fluid and the solid so you can actually increase the concentration of the solid because you're just measuring that mismatch and you can actually go to much higher solids concentration so this is an area that we're working on right now in our slurry flow loop the other effect if particles aren't sphere is you get changes in frictional stress. Frictional, by frictional stress, I mean stress is associated with particles that are in sustained contacts. So these are highly dense phase systems. And um, I mentioned that we are doing these cratering experiments with NASA. We um, flew in this zero gravity aircraft. We were able to make these cratering experiments. We just shoot high speed jets at beds of particles and we look at the cratering behavior as a function of time. And we we find very interesting results. If you look at particles like sand that are, they're rough, but still generally rounded shaped particles, you get very different cratering behavior than a particle like JSC1A, which is a lunar soil simulant. So these kind of particles are extremely rough and jagged. And the kind of craters you get are very long, narrow craters because the particles are very cohesive. There's a lot of mechanical interlocking. So the stress behavior in terms of the frictional behavior is much different. We can easily simulate, I won't, I won't, we'll talk about these simulations, but we can easily simulate that. We get perfect agreement with our models with cratering of sand. We have not been able to simulate this yet because these beha this frictional behavior is very complex due, due to this mechanical interlocking. And the last thing that I want to mention is we get changes in this kinetic collisional stress. What I mean by this kinetic collisional stress is um, I showed you that plot earlier of how the stress varied with volume fraction. Um, I should go back to that real quick. Okay. You see that it goes through this U-shaped behavior, okay? So the stress at high solids fractions is very high, increases. And that's because this region is dominated by collisional interactions between particles. So as particles get more and more concentrated, we have particles um, colliding with each other that increases the stress transmission due to collisions, the momentum flux due to collisions. At low solids concentration, the stress once again goes up because the main mechanism for momentum flux is due to translation of particles from one shear layer to another. So you get particles due to their fluctuations translating from one shear layer to another carrying their momentum. So you get this characteristic U-shaped curve. And if you have non-spherical particles, you can look at the same stress behavior and see how that varies with different particle shapes. So we do the exact same simulations in this shear box. We just build non-spherical particles by linking spheres together. They can either overlap 
or they can just be linked. These particles are rigid connections. We don't allow them right now to deform, but you can form all a wide variety of particle shapes. You shear them and look at how the effect of stress changes with the particle shape. So this is a simple 2D simulation. Um, these are elongated change of six particles. So these are six particles linked together, aspect ratio of six with its very rough surface because we're not overlapping the spheres. We let these particles um, proceed in the simulation. We measure the stress, allow that to come to a steady state for a given um, uh, particle shape, a given concentration, a given coefficient of restitution, a given coefficient of fric friction. And we look at how the stress varies. And what we find is that as we elongate the particle, for instance, these particles all have the same equivalent um, area, these are 2D simulations right now that I'm talking about, the stresses in the low volume fraction regime are decreased and in the high volume fraction re regime are increased with increasing elongation ratio. The reason the stresses go down in the low solid volume fraction is because these elongated particles are uh, as they rotate, okay, and they're very random in their orienta in their orientations. The mean free path between those collisions decreases. So our momentum flux due to translation between shear layers is going down. So that's why the stress transmission decreases. In high solid volume fraction, because I have these elongated particles, and they form. Um, uh, these structures that are vibrating with high collisional frequency. I think I have a movie here. Hopefully this movie will work. Okay, um, you see these almost looks like clumps of particles. Um, they're not agglomerated, but they're moving at very high collision frequency. So this is what drives the collisional stress to increase dramatically when I have elongated rough particles. So our goal of this work is to eventually develop a constitutive model to describe non-spherical particle shapes and that we can readily input into a continuum-based framework. And through, um, I won't go through these whole set of heuristics, we can we can deduce that the effective stress, and based on the simulations results that we've achieved, that the stress for 2D simulations we proposed was um, proportional one over the average projected particle length squared. The average projected particle length is the, the length that a particle sees over its whole random orientations. And in fact, we were able to map all of the particles into this relationship, one over the stress, the projected length squared. All the shapes that we investigated fell on this line. Now this is true for a dilute system where particles are seeing a random orientation. Now the beauty of this is all we have to do is take a slight modification to the kinetic theory for spherical modded dispersed particles and we can easily simulate in any kind of pneumatic conveying situation a, a, um, a non-spherical particle and just adjust our kinetic theory very simply in a 2D situation. And in, in, uh, for very rough, rounded particles, so particles that are generally rounded with different degrees of roughness, we see changes in the stress, but if you look at the order of magnitude of these changes, it's still very small. In that previous slide with the elongation, the stresses were increasing by three orders of magnitude when you compared a sphere to an elongated chain of six at higher um, solid volume fraction. And this is very important because when early on in my career when I would be simulating fluid catalytic cracking risers, for instance. These are um, risers used to crack gas oil to produce gasoline. I would give these talk and I would be using very simple kinetic theory or, um, description for the solid phase stress, describe the flow behavior in these risers, and a person from Amico at that time would be sitting in the audience or Shell or Exxon, well how are these simulations working so well when you've, dis when you've assumed a spherical monodispersed particle? And the idea the idea is because that assumption for a generally rounded particle that's rough is not so bad. The stresses don't vary that considerably. However, if we would have had fibers that are elongated and, and rough, then the assumption would have been very poor.
So we can either, we can also increase the number of spheres in a long, in an elongated particle and look at the effect of the roughness, whether the particle is rough and elongated or smooth and elongated. And what we find is that the changes in the stress at the low solid volume fraction level is very small, but at the high solid volume fraction, the stress comes down considerably because those collisional stresses are decreased. If you remember, if you remember that simulation before that I showed you, this is the exact same aspect ratio, the exact same concentration, but now these particles are smooth. And you don't see that same structure, that blocky structure, and the collisional stresses are greatly reduced with these smooth elongated particles versus these rough elongated particles. So, and then we also looked at, well, how many constituent spheres does it take to describe a non-spherical particle? Well, if we have a smooth elongated particle, if we, if it's an aspect ratio of six and we fill in one sphere in between and describe that elongated particle with 11 constituent spheres and look, then look at 21 constituent spheres, the, the stress results with 11 or 21 is not different. That means the beauty of that is we don't need a lot of constituent spheres to describe the general shape of a non-spherical particle and get a measure of its effective stress that we can then input into a CFD simulation. We've now um, finally looked at a lot of 3D simulations. So um, we see the exact same effects in, in 3D that we saw in 2D. So for instance, we looked at the effect of um, solids concentration. These are simulations with an aspect ratio of four with 2.5% solids fraction. And um, I just want to describe these color code here. We're applying a shear to this uh, to these particle systems. Um, we're applying a shear of 0.5. So um, the uh, the color indicates the velocity in the streamwise direction, and these are just dry granular flows. So um, we can achieve part particles with a streamwise velocity greater than 0.5 because that just means the particle fluctuation intensity in the particle velocity in the streamwise direction is greater than 0.5 because of its additional fluctuations that happen to be in that streamwise direction. And you can see particles that have um, a high velocity in the streamwise direction, even permeating into the center of this assembly. And that just means the particle trans, the momentum flux due to translation is great, is very large at these low solids volume fraction. That's, um, that's why our stress increases at low concentration. As we increase the concentration to 10% solids, same aspect ratio, you don't see a large quantity of these particles that have high streamwise velocity permeating into the center. That's because our translational component is going down, and that's why our stresses are reducing. But then at the very high concentrations, 50%, you see um, uh, this, sim this uh, transmission of stress, and this is due to the high concentration of collisional um, collisions, so we have high collisional stress, which translates momentum um, throughout the particle assembly. And then if we smooth out the those particles, same again at 50%, we do not see the same level of transmission. So the collisional stresses are reduced. And we've done a wide variety of particle shapes. We can build any kind of particle shapes and, effect, and measure their effective stress. We get a plot of that stress and then we can input that into a CFD um, simulation. Um, the last slide I want to mention is we propose then for 3D simulations that the stress would be proportional to one over the pre average projected area. In 2D, we propose that it was proportional to the length. That, act, that assumption actually did not hold to be true, um, but we did find that it, uh, the stress is proportional to the, um, uh, the probability of the particle collision, so we did find that scaling, and right now we're trying to work with that for a different, uh, for a different particle configuration. We're trying to predict that collision frequency and then input that into a um, CFD simulation, so that's kind of where we're at right now. So in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to 
uh, emphasize these two methods of simulating particle flows and indicate the linkage. And one of the key linkages is that this discrete element simulations can validate and develop constituent relations for continuum simulations that can simulate large scale processes. And um, we can certainly do that for particle size distribution effects and particle shape effects. And we found that this uh, effective stress for spherical particles, when we change that to non-spherical particles, um, we, if we introduce the effect of the projected length, we can describe those stresses and the collisional probability in the case of 3D systems. And all of this, I should qualify as for a dilute system, where particles have a random orientation. When we move to a dense system, then particles have a preferred orientation. I haven't shown any of those results. But um, there we basically, I, I'm not sure that we can find a scaling rule, because for every shape, particles move into a different preferred, preferred, orientation, preferred orientation. For instance, for elongated particles, they tend to line with the flow. For um, generally rounded shape particles, there's a different configuration. Um, so there we would just have to conduct the simulation, basically empirically measure the stress for that given particle shape and then input that into a CFD simulation. And we found that particles that were elongated and rough exhibit very high stresses. Particles that were rough and generally rounded didn't have that much stress variation from spherical particles. And you really didn't need a large number of constituent spheres to form a general shape of a non-spherical particle to get a measure of its effective stress. So I thank you very much for your attention and, and appreciate the invitation to come here to speak. Thank you. I'm sorry, I guess I was a little long there. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, I understand that for a given system, a hybrid system, you consider a simpler version with you know, some assumption, do a random mean simulation and get the custodial relationship. That's a direct approach. Mm -hmm. Now, I need your views on, uh, on this approach. Given a system, suppose that you have all patient values, like velocity distribution, temperature distribution. How about inverting that problem to get the custodial relationship? If you have the velocity distribution and the, the granular temperature distribution, yes. yeah, then, I mean, then you already have it. Then you don't even need the simulation because that's what we get out of the simulation. We get the granular temperature distribution, which allows us to, to measure the effect of stress. It is possible, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Absolutely. I mean, uh, how would directly measuring it? Um, I mean, the stress is, for instance, the kinetic stress, the, the, the uh, low uh, concentration component is direct. If you know the granular temperature and the co local concentration, you know what, and that's a, you can compute the kinetic stress. And if at the high concentration, if you know the collisional frequency and the distribution of granular temperature and the, the local concentration, you can compute the collisional stress. So if you, yeah, if you know the local concentration and the temperature distribution, you should be able to, I mean, that's what we get out of these simulations, and that allows us to compute the stress. Other student questions? Uh, uh, here in the booth, uh, kind of uh, what kind of bonding do you use in the process? Do you have to do the process close to the bonding, or do you have to do the bonding, or do you have to do the bonding? Um, okay, so when particles interact with a wall, that's a great question. So particles, it's not a no-slip condition like a fluid. So particles interact with the wall, and um, unless it's an extremely rough wall, when a particle's colliding with a wall, they're going to have a ring bound velocity. So there's an effective slip of particles at the wall. So um, basically, we make a, um, a balance between the effective stress in the assembly and the momentum transfer to the wall when particles collide with a wall. So there's a balance there. And there's also a balance on energy. So particles have a fluctuation energy near the wall, and that energy is going to be conducted to the wall through these particles wall interactions. So um, yes, there are, and my uh, thesis advisor is the one who de developed those, and those are kind of this state of the art in these kind of simulations. But yes, it's, it's definitely a slip condition. It's not a no-slip condition in a particle assembly. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 
do you expect like a uh, solid traction where these 3D computer, computer models that you have developed to break down? Like, is there a upper limit on, on the solid traction where you expect these models to break down? In the simulations? Yeah, they, they use continuous uh, model simulations using these computer models. Is there a limit on the solid traction that you can go up to? Okay, so um, so as in the in the um, in the kinetic theory type of assumption, as you increase the solids concentration, then the particle velocity distribution um, uh, uh, becomes very complex. So how you describe that velocity distribution, what kind of perturbation you have for Maxwellian dictates how good your continuum theory is. But generally, up to about 50% solids, it's a reasonable, um, uh, concentration uh, for these kind of kinetic theories, but certainly after 50%, not only do you have an issue with describing the um, velocity distribution, but you also have not only contacts by direct collisions, but you have this issue with the sustained contacts. So you have not only a collisional stresses, but you also have kinetic stresses. So you have to add another stress mechanism into the model. And frankly, a lot of these frictional models uh, are very empirical at this at this point. So it's a frictional stress mechanism that you have to, to describe. So I would say certainly up to about 50%, the models are very reasonable. Thank you. Yeah, question? Yeah, so in your model, I see that um, for predicting the particle space stresses, for you, have, you did a great job in terms of predicting that for non spherical particles. So in terms of um, sizes, so you took into account just the ideal case of um, having one mono-sized particles, but how, um, how do you take into account particle size distributions? Because that's generally the case to have distribution. So I was just wondering, how do you take that in the model? Mm -hmm. are, are you talking about the, the continuum approach or the discrete approach? The continuum. In the di continuum approach. Okay, so um, again, it has to go, it goes back to the dense gas kinetic theory and the assumptions that are made when you start describing two particle phase. So some of the assumptions when you are modifying dense gas kinetic theory for two different particles, are we gonna say each particle, for instance, has the same amount of, of kinetic energy? This is the kind of uh, equal partition of energy? Are we going to say that these particle phases are distributed in Maxwellian? What are the kind of, you have to start modifying this dense gas kinetic theory and you have to start making some assumptions. And um, right now, this theory has been worked out in detail for bimodal. And um, in fact, my former student, Christine, has now even worked out a polydisperse theory, again, based on some assumptions that have been validated for, um, with using this discrete element method. So. It's again, it's a modification of dense gas kinetic theory, how you describe the velocity distribution, um, uh, what kind of assumption you have about the distribution of kinetic energy between all these phases. Yes. We have another student question. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Attrition, yes. Um, I'm, I mentioned that, but I am not doing that. Um, uh, I think Rampke would probably be a better person. Um, I have to say, all of my work really uh, has a, one of the, uh, uh, everything in my work has, uh, ha, has a fixed size distribution, and that this size distribution does not evolve with time. So all my CFD sim simulations are not coupled right now with a population balance. And that's certainly an area of research. Um, Rodney Fox at Iowa State has been uh, heavily involved in taking a lot of these multi-phase hydrodynamic models and starting to couple those with um, the population balance equations to describe uh, polymerization processes, etc. where you not only have the complex hydrodynamics, where you have two phases which behave independently, so you can't write one equation of motion like in aerosols, for instance, one equation of motion and then population balance. Now you have two separate phases, two separate um, hydrodynamic equations for the fluid and the solid phase, plus uh, you're tracking the evolving size distribution. That's a, uh, we have not dealt with that problem. But there are, are people working on that, yeah. Any more student questions? 
Yeah, I mean, we at this point we we have not done any validating experiments. I, so for the multiple contacts, yes, we do include all the forces that act on the particle, and at those high collisional um, rates, we. The simulations take a lot of time because we, we decrease that time step to very low to, to decrease the concentrate, the number of those multiple contacts. So, um, it, well, you probably saw the simulations typically at the very elongated particles certainly aren't going above 50% because, because of these multiple contacts and if, and also overlap problems if you don't keep that, that time step down. So yes, the, the simulations become very computationally expensive and the multiple contacts could be an issue, yes. That's a good point. Okay, one last student question and then we'll get to you. You're solving in a continuum framework. You have expect that you expect that solid density would change from point to point. So do you have like something according to like equation of state of the particles or you can force continuity? The solid density changing? You have the you have the particles going around, you expect the solid density would be the solid fraction would be different in some point. It's going to be a constant to go up are you talking about the discrete simulations? In the continuum. In the continuum. So yes, the solid fraction is changing. So um, uh, so that's so basically um, um, that's another um, dependent variable. So we have by solving the the equation of motion, the equation of continuity, plus we have. Um, the granular energy balance that we solve, all of these coupled together, um, and the two components of the equation of motion, the various components, we have a, that whole set of equations allows us to get, yes, the, the local solids concentration, the granular temperature, all the components of the velocity, and the pressure. So with this additional granular energy balance, that allows us to, to determine the local solids fraction. Is that, so, yeah, I mean, that is, um, that's uh, part of the dependent variable. And the, the, it's, the key is this extra balance, the granular energy, basically, that gives us that information. Professor Ram Krishna, did you have a question? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> okay, with, with respect to your amusing reference to people banging on hoppers to. <laughs> to promote flow, I was wondering if you had occasion to study the effect of vibrating conditions on hopper boundaries to see how well the flow is enhanced. Because I think the banging comes after you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. So there's a way to not get to that stage. <laughs> Um, we haven't done that, but um, now that we have done these kind of cohesive simulations, we have um, formulated design rules for different levels of cohesion. What, if you have certain angles and certain orifices, you won't get into this problem. But no, we haven't looked at, if you have this fixed hopper and you start applying vibration, at what level of vibration, yeah, what frequency would break up the, we have not done that. But but certainly that's a lot of people in the granular flow committee, community are looking at effective vibration and particle flows, yeah. Yes. I a philosophical question, or question. So, um, I just gave a lecture on fluidized beds and we are about to talk about the two phase models, so you know two algebraic equations, or maybe two ordinary differential equations. Uh, so my question then is, um, how, can we educate people, students, or people going into industry on the choice of when to use which level of sophistication? Because it seems to me, a fluid bed, I could use a two-phase model, very simple assumptions. I could go to a simulation, a continuum-based simulation like you showed, or I could go to a mixture of DEM and continuum, and you increase in the computational time. 
Um, have you any thoughts on how we make this hierarchical and say, if this is what you want to do, this is the model you use, if this is what you need to do, this is the model you use? Um, I, I think that is definitely neat. In fact, a lot of my interaction with industry is about that. I mean, I work with people in CFD type groups who have access to these commercial codes, whether the CFD code or discrete element code, and what they want to know from me are those kind of things. You know, for this system, what approach should I take? Can I trust these models for this system? And yeah, it almost is an algorithm. If you have this, go to this. Um, so, I mean, my anecdote is a, a, a colleague from another university who was involved in a big project did some very massive uh, DEM slash CFD simulations of a fluid bed dryer mm -hmm. as part of the project. And for one scale of the fluid bed dryer, essentially what it showed was that the temperature was uniform in the fluidized bed, which would be my starting one line assumption mm -hmm. without doing yeah. the hours of simulation. So it's a sort of like getting that. But, but for another design, it wasn't that at all. The flow patterns were different and there were temperature gradients where you didn't mm -hmm. to be. So it's a, it's a sort of a, when can you do it in the back of an envelope and then you need a thousand hour simulation? Yeah, I mean, because all of those are going to be dictated by what your size characteristic of your particles are, what the size of the bed. I mean, yeah, the general assumption is fluidized beds have uniform temperature, but yeah, you know, that's sometimes not necessarily true. Absolutely. Um, in fact, um, I tried, uh, I don't know, I think it was when I was at Purdue, I tried to write a, a couple proposals to NSF. It, it wasn't in the engineering division. It's funny that you bring this. It was in, I don't know, a management dis division. It was about developing exactly what you said, kind of a guide rules for people that are doing these kind of simulations. If you have this kind of simulation, go, uh, maybe because I wasn't in that community, they didn't buy that. But I, I really see that that is a need in industry because you have they have all these tools and there's really a lack of knowledge of what tools when, um, you know, are these models good for these systems? And I think that's something we as academics can certainly provide and, and help. All right, I would like to uh, thank you at this time. And before you clap, we do have two centennial uh, trinkets for thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very and thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks again.